I'm, I'm, I'm going to use today as an opportunity to talk about some empirical work. I appreciate that many of the papers uh, in the context of the symposium are not uh, empirical, but I, uh, partly because I'm engaged in an empirical project that I find enormously interesting and, and uh, is constantly, the data from it is constantly challenging my uh, preconceptions about policing, police organisation, police knowledge. So I, I'm in that wonderful phase where we're looking at the data, but I'm not writing anything yet. So everything's really interesting and new, and I haven't had to try and think about how I'm going to make sense of it and actually publish it. So it's that nice, it's a warm feeling for the next six months, and then, and then the difficult stuff begins. It's also, it seemed appropriate uh, in the context of symposium because I, of Richard's interest in empirical work around policing. I, one of the axes I occasionally uh, grind uh, at, in public forums is the fact that as criminologists, and I count myself as one, we don't often do enough empirical work uh, in the context of policing. There's a sense to which we already know it. Um, we, we, we know about police culture, we know about police organisations. That work was done uh, by, by various uh, distinguished American scholars, British scholars, and, and, and then again people like, like Richard in Canada. And I'm quite keen to keep that moving. I, I've, and, uh, and so my, my talk today is a little bit about some of the results we're getting from a, a two-year uh, ethnography of covert policing. Um, and I'll give a little bit of background to that because uh, I'm still quite stunned we're even, we're even allowed to do it. Um, two colleagues of mine at the University of Oxford and when I was there before I moved here, we started a, uh, a, a non-participant study of uh, undercover policing in the United Kingdom. Um, after a number of years of trying to negotiate access and get funding, the stars aligned and not only did we get... Uh, what, now, looking back, seems like an extremely large amount of money, about £750,000. <coughs> but we've got all the major police organisations, the Federation, the uh, Associated Chiefs Police Officers, uh, and a number of very large police forces to basically give us unfettered access uh, to their covert operations, uh, with some limited exceptions. And uh, to my still continuing surprise, allowed me to put two researchers out in the field with their officers. So we actually have generated uh, now about 1,000 hours of observational work um, as my colleagues, so I didn't have to do this because I had young children and I had a reason to, to get out of it. My colleagues spent a lot of time in vans outside of houses, listening to uh, wiretaps, uh, following undercover officers around, speaking to police informants, etc. Um, and so we've, we think, and maybe others in the audience can correct me on this, as f we think this is actually the first ever ethnographic observational study of covert policing activity in any commonwealth, common law, or jurisdiction. There's a lot of stuff that's done in the United States in, in, in sort of the slicing. People have looked at informants, um, Gary Marx's seminal work on undercover policing. Marx's work is, and it's, it's hugely important, but it was largely documentary and interview based. And we, we're doing that as well, with the classic three-pronged methodology. But uh, as far as we know, no one's actually been able to send people out in the field um, in these contexts. And, and as a consequence, we, we've generated uh, quite a, a rich amount of data. And that if I, I won't refer this again, but one of, one of, uh, there are times where I, when I'm looking at those field notes, I, I've often thought it would be nice to sit, would have sat, would have been nice to sit with Richard and show him some of it. I think he would have got a, a kick out of a lot of it and found it very interesting. Um, so I also want to give a little bit of background to that research and, and partly explains why we we're allowed to do it, but also why at the particular moment in time it was interesting. Um, it's interesting both because we don't know a great deal about it. Right? Covert policing is one of those areas of policing that, that are, we actually have very little information about as, as sort of the outside world knows little about how it actually operates in practice and how the information it generates actually seeps into, is used, integrated into the sort of policing practice we're more familiar with. So how, does the, how do they generate the knowledge from covert practices? How is that knowledge understood internally? How is it disseminated through the organisation? How does it inform regular decision making, if at all? Right? Is, it, is it a silo? Is it hermetically sealed from other policing activities? Is it integrated? How do the different cultures uh, around what might be called the sort of public face policing versus the covert policing, how do those worlds uh, speak to each other, if at all? Um, so that was, and as for someone like me who's been very interested in how police organisations work in terms of moving information around, particularly when that information is technologically uh, influenced or produced in some cases, uh, that was very interesting. What was also going on when we, in the years leading up to this research uh, was the police were grappling with, with a quite significant change in the regulatory environment. Um, I could spend all day talking about the, the, the sort of history of, of the regulation of covert practices in Britain. But to cut a long story short, in 2000, uh, the Regulation Investory Powers Act was passed in England, partly, uh, England, uh, England Wales, uh, partly 
to uh, make sure the police practices were compliant with the new human rights regime that was coming in, but also to consolidate lots of law that had been sort of going on around covert practice in the 1980s and 1990s. So it's this massive piece of legislation. It's, it, it sort of changed the entire regulatory environment overnight uh, in terms of how one authorised operations, how one uh, dealt with the information generated by those uh, operations, how that information became evidence, etc. Um, and I'll talk about this a little bit later. Uh, it's fair to say it's a terrible piece of legislation. It's a classic example of a piece of legislation written quickly, lots of bits grabbed from other pieces of legislation, grabbed from position papers, etc. It's like those omnibus nightmares um, that individual sections don't speak to each other, individual uh, parts don't speak to each other, terminology is loose, used in a loose, ambiguous way. Uh, for lawyers who work in the field, it's, it's, it's a hugely difficult piece of legislation to interpret. The courts have had enormous problems with it and the police have found it nightmarishly difficult to understand. And that was the, partly why they allowed us access was because they were curious about how they were dealing with the legislation. One of the things that we actually uh, committed to doing uh, as part of the project was to looking at how that regulatory change has affected police practice. So we, are, we have an obligation to report back to the police and say what, what we think this has actually done to you. Uh, and the message is not particularly positive. Um, the second uh, background factor was the changing technological environment. Uh, again, it's a longer story, but what you start to see, I think, in the 90s, 80s, 90s, uh, and, and continuing, is both an increase in the capability of surveillance technologies. They can do lots more stuff. Right? And the, my earlier work was on CCTV cameras, and the shift from analog to digital is a profound one, um, both in terms of just the physical space required to do, you know, required for the equipment, but also the amount of information you can generate, what you can do with it, uh, etc. So there's increase in capability, but also in capacity, in that you can do things cheaper. You can do more of it. Right? A lot of the technology that in the 1970s would have been extremely expensive, uh, particularly when you're talking about wiretaps, um, now is relatively easy to do. Right? And uh, you can imagine what the advent of mobile phones has done in terms of being able to intercept communications and the sort of information they regularly keep and the way in which the police and, and to a lesser extent the security services uh, can get at that information. And then, of course, there's the background, the changing discourse uh, around matters of security, uh, the increased responsibility given to the police to deal with questions of organised crime and terrorism. So there's a whole set of other factors that are driving changes in the covert world. Right? There's new responsibilities, or rather uh, heavier responsibilities for these things uh, being imposed. Um, so we started with a lot of questions, uh, the sort of normal ethnographic questions of what happens on a day-to-day -day basis, how does this all work? Uh, we have followed, we tried to follow essentially from the moment uh, the police decide to do something covert right through the authorisation process, right through the resourcing process into the implementation and then the final turning of that into evidence and going to court. So we've tried to do this longitudinal study of cases. Uh, so we've, done, we've been doing all of that and, and the normal things about interviewing, canteen, all that stuff. But on top of that, we've also been trying to look at how the police have responded to this radical change in the regulatory environment. Uh, and how has this changed the way they think about knowledge and information within their own organisations? Um, and we've been surprised um, by some of the results. And I'm, I'm conscious of time, I'm going to move through them, uh, some of these preliminary thoughts that we have about what's going on and why I think that's interesting. Um, the first thing, uh, and going into this, we, we weren't expecting the level of sophistication we saw. And I don't just mean technical organisational sophistication, because they certainly have that. Uh, it's, a, it's labyrinthine, the covert world. I have uh, diagrams on my wall that look like a, a small child has scribbled with multiple coloured pens, explaining to me the, the relationship between all the different people who are responsible for a particular covert operation. The sort of diagrams that you do, thinking it will make it clearer, and it, you just suddenly realise that's not possible um, once you finish the diagram. But independent of that, what I think is interesting is the police have very and sophisticated uh, epistemologies. They have very sophisticated internal theories of knowledge about what constitutes good knowledge, what constitutes bad knowledge. Uh, and within that, uh, what makes something reliable, how one compares different types of covert information, right? The information you derive from an informant, as opposed to the information you derive from an undercover officer, as opposed to the information you derive from a direct source like a wiretap. They have very textured understandings of those things. And actually, they have competitions amongst themselves about the reliability, veracity, authenticity of these things. And what, is, what we found fascinating was the degree of self-reflection about that. That the fact that when they start to pull these pieces of information, they recognise there's a problem. 
of apples, oranges, and pears. And I think going into it, we expected that what happened was all these things came in seamlessly like you see on the television. And I appreciate I, I've been influenced uh, <laughs> by years of uh, obsession with watching uh, police programs and The Wire and, and these things. And what I think we envisaged was that there was a coming together of these piece of information in a very seamless fashion. In fact, that's not the case at all. The different constituencies that produce these different forms of information have very different views on how useful they are, how reliable they are, how much precedence one should be given to another. Uh, and there's enormous competition within the organisation, even quite tight groups of people, uh, about who should, which piece of information should trump others, particularly when they conflict. And from an organisational point of view, in terms of the way the organisation generates and thinks about the knowledge, the police have really grappled with how to sort of structure that. And what we're seeing is they, they do a number of things. Uh, one is they anonymise a lot of stuff, which is they decouple the information from the source, and they do it very deliberately. So, for example, often in a briefing where there's lots of multiple multi pieces of information coming into a tactical team who are making decisions about where to take an operation next, they won't know whether information came from an informant, an undercover officer, or a tap. That's taken off. That, that label is taken away from the information. And the reasoning that was given to us for this was a sense within the police that often police officers were prejudicing particular types of information because it came from a particular person. Right? Experienced officer A, it's his informant, he's been in, he or she has been in the force for a very long time, um, and so we should give more credence right, to his informants than perhaps officer B. And the police have come to the conclusion, at least the, the, the force that we worked within, that this was a very bad thing. That actually led them often to make very bad decisions, to miss pieces of information. Um, and this is becoming particularly uh, present in their <coughs> minds when they're dealing with serious organised crime and, and to some extent terrorism. They're very frightened of missing things. They're very frightened of it being them who had the piece of information in front of them and they didn't pay attention to it. This is an abiding anxiety, as you can, and it's not hard to see why. Uh, in the current climate. So they're doing interesting things. Uh, we were expecting siloing to be disappearing. Right? One of the things you think about in, in modern organisations, they're, they're trying to get rid of information silos. They're trying to spread out this sort of, this sort of natural <coughs> communication between different forms of information. What the police are actually doing is siloing things in order to uh, remove uh, authorship. So that things stand, their, uh, their variability is judged by how well they adhere to or confirm other pieces of independent information. So if you have four things telling you X, you might not know where those four things came from, but they all tell you X. That's a good thing. That, that seems reliable to us. But we have four things where we know where they came from. We might be inclined where there's a conflict between them. Right? So there's a fifth thing. That might trump the other four because we think the fifth thing is more, you know, we have more commitment to it because of whatever uh, prejudice we might bring to that. So there is an interesting... I th and the, we're trying to make sense of that, isn't it? It's sort of a, making sense of that data, it seems like a very rich picture. But that, that's one of the earlier uh, things that's coming out. The other thing we discovered, and how we're going to write this up, I'm not sure, because I think uh, the police will be unhappy about it, is that they make a very clear distinction between knowledge that they're going to use as evidence and knowledge that they use for something else. Knowledge that they use as evidence, they're very cautious about, because ultimately it may end up in court and it needs to be admissible, and they all live in fear of a case collapsing because they made a mistake about admissibility, right? Information is improperly obtained, you get it to court, the judge throws it out, the case falls to bits and you've wasted potentially hundreds of thousands of pounds and all this kind of work. So there's that narrative that's a very strong narrative and, and you can imagine the managerial context, that, 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 that talk is very important. And then there's information that the police acquire with no intention of ever bringing it to a court and how they feel bound by rules in those cases. And the short answer is they don't. Right. So the example that's, uh, that was given to us and, and, and I think is a very opposite one is in the case of a kidnapping, the police have told us that all bets are off. They won't go through the normal authorisation procedures. They will call up mobile phone companies without the correct senior authorisations because they, their argument is usually in a kidnapping, particularly of a child, they have about a 24-hour window. They will tell you they have about 24 hours to recover the child and usually after 24 hours you can assume that they're gone. Right? Particularly when you're talking about child trafficking cases where they've got there's some European component. Uh, so their view is 24 hours, protection of life trumps prosecution. Their primary goal is to retrieve the child. They're not going to bother looking for, they're not bother, going to bother with the authorisation process. And senior officer said we, we will give carte blanche to officers to do that. 
tell them, go, whatever you need to do, <coughs> do it. We'll sort out the, the legal aspect of it later. Because the reality is if we get the child back, who's going to really be upset with us because we strong-armed the mobile phone company into giving us all these records um, without the correct procedure? And the reality is we may never take that information to court anyway. So it's very interesting they have this set of re you know, knowledge in the legal sphere that's regulated and this whole set of other knowledges, acquisition processes, that are completely independent. Right? And we watch training exercises where they were training to do exactly that. Right? Someone's gone missing, uh, they enact, I found these wonderful things, they, they enact these proper role plays in public, right? where they actually have police officers out in public doing the thing over a course of days and pretend like a real world exercise. And they give them these get out of jail free cards. So when the police officer breaks into some, uh, runs across somebody's garden and the person complains, they give them this card saying, ring this number, we'll compensate you. Which are very valuable apparently, the police trade them amongst each other, very keen to get hold of these, these get out of jail free cards because it also means you don't have to pay for your meal while you're out in the field. You can just drop it on McDonald's desk and they call up and the police pay for it. So we discovered the whole world of uh, these cards on training exercises. Um, Did you get card rating? Yeah. No, they wouldn't let us anywhere near them. And one of my colleagues, was, uh, she's very charming and did everything she could to get hold of one and, and got no, no purchase whatsoever. Um, how am I for time, Richard? Is that another five? Yeah. Five minutes? Okay, I'll move through the last two points relatively quickly. Uh, second thing, we expected, and I'll be blunt, we expected the ambiguity in the legal environment to be seen by the police as a wonderful thing. Because certainly in my time as a criminalist, I've always come to believe that the police thrive on ambiguity. Right, because they're very good at exploiting ambiguity and using discretion to do the things that they want to do. Right? And certainly in England, where the Police and Criminal Evidence Act, a lot of evidence suggests that they adapted to those rules very quickly, went back to old practices, right? with some modifications, but generally speaking, it didn't disturb them that much. What we found in the context of uh, the regulatory environment in England is that the ambiguity has caused them great anxiety. They find it extremely upsetting and difficult because they're not sure what to do. They're not sure what the authorization process is. They're not sure whether they've done enough to get something admitted in court. Uh, and the guidance from the regulator has been, in many cases, opaque and unhelpful in their view. And what's happened is that a whole sub-bureaucracy has developed within the police around understanding the legislation. There is this massive bureaucracy within, the within forces across the country which is solely devoted to trying to understand the legislation and advise officers on the ground and senior managers and when things move up to them. Uh, and the irony is, uh, and part of my job as the sort of lawyer amongst us, is to look at this as much of it is massive overkill. Only an extremely insecure, terrified individual would come up with some of the regulations they've come up with. It speaks to a deep neurosis uh, within the force about the legitimacy of its own decision-making processes. Uh, and within that, what they regard to be uh, properly acquired knowledge, right? What is, what's legitimate within the structure of the, of the regulatory framework? What can we present? Pardon? Um, so, for example, uh, cross-border within forces, right? So you're following a car. It goes over the border from force A to force B. Uh, for a variety of reasons... Uh, Force A thinks that they can follow the car off into Force B's uh, territory, and that's fine. The, the initial authorisation they have will extend across the, the boundary. Force B doesn't think so. And so Force B, uh, or they call ahead and they say to Force B, this person's coming over into your uh, force. We have an authorisation. We think it, you can, in a sense, piggyback on the back of it. Please follow them. Or when you're talking about static CCTV cameras, right, where you can co-opt them into the initial authorisation, Force B says, no, we don't think so. Our advice, internal advice, is different. And the operation collapses. Right? That, we've seen a lot of that. Um, a great cost, uh, particularly in organised crime, where they're trying to track organised crime movements across often five or six forces within a particular geographical region. Um, uh, I'll come to the last point. What this has generated, and this is the sort of interesting, sort of, uh, back to the earlier point about knowledge, what we've seen is competing layers of internal expertise. People filled the gap particularly in middle management, people set themselves up in the force as experts on this particular part of the uh, legislation. And in so doing, they've created all sorts of fiefdom competition, etc. There's no uh, one set of interpretations even within the same division of a force. There are particular individuals who, have, who hold forth. I'm the one who's been to the training. I'm the one who has read the latest report. I'm the one who uh, has the national accreditation X or Y. 
And as a consequence, that generates within forces uh, schisms about what constitutes good evidence, bad evidence, properly obtained covert knowledge and improperly obtained. And so what we've found is, uh, well, two things. One is that all of this turned out to be much more complicated than we thought it was, which is, I guess, what usually happens when you do empirical work. Um, and secondly, that actually the, within the covert world, and partly because it's not open to scrutiny from the outside world, right? There's no, they're kind of stuck amongst themselves. They're a small world. Lots of things that they deal with, they don't talk about even in the wider police organisation. It's hard for them to go and speak to lawyers. It's hard for them to get uh, academics to engage in discussions with them because, in a sense, there's only so much they can tell them. They are hermetically sealed off and they're having real, really profound difficulties making sense of what the information is in terms of its sense of legitimacy, reliability, uh, dependability. Um, I'm going to stop there because I think I've probably spoken enough, but that's, that was, um, that's what I'd like to report. Questions, like the, like the empirical one. One of the things I was I was curious about um, in in the United States and I know a few other countries, but I know the states best. That a lot of work, a lot of funding, and programmatic things that were set up to fight terrorism, surveillance, and all sorts of things, loosening of laws, etc. Um, have tended to really be used in uh, in other police work rather than than terrorist yeah. terrorist activities and so on. Do you find things like that in uh, in, in your research? Yeah, it's, it's, it's expansion of the net or whatever. Yeah, it's been a difficult. One of the things that I, mean, I mentioned that there were certain things that were off limits to us. One of the, one of the things that was off limits to us was dealing with the security services. So there are gaps. We've, we've, one of the few things they've redacted for us is where it's clear the security services have stepped in. Right, that, that's where it gets blacked out. Uh, off the record, we kind of find out what's going on. Uh, and I've, I've done some work with security services in other contexts. Uh, it's very clear in Britain the security services don't regard themselves as legally bound by anything. Right? They like the security services in most places. They take the view they do what they do and, and woe betide anyone who, who draws attention to the legal irregularities of that. So uh, where I think it's really interesting is organised crime. Because some of the preemptive sort of ideas that you get about terrorism are coming into the organised crime context. So more zealous covert uh, policing because it's this notion you can you know, stop it before it really gets out of hand. Um, and pressure from European partners to do so, right? You, we see things setting up in Britain which we think are, going, are related to these things and we'd like you to intervene earlier, set up, start gathering information even though there's no local impact yet. Right? There's no sense to which these people are doing anything that's affecting the police in that area. So, so to some extent that preemptive turn, right? That, that you can see some of that. Uh, but mostly uh, the regulatory environment is trying to deal with this new, this new notion that uh, and it's new to British policing that these things have to be authorised. This is only a relatively recent 25 years, right? The old British maxim that if it wasn't forbidden, you could do anything you like, right? Well, the legal British English legal maxim uh, was taken very literally by the police up until the early 80s, um, when there were a series of European court judges which actually judgments which actually said no, you can't just. Uh, as they were doing in one, actually quite recently, intercept all communication between the British mainland and Northern Ireland, which the British government refuses to acknowledge, but they've already had a judgment against them in the European court saying, actually, it's clear that you did this. You, you literally, through a, a signal station uh, on the, the uh, West Coast, were intercepting literally everything, including privileged information, lawyer-client uh, discussions. Uh, and they had a judgment rendered against them. The British government still refuses to even acknowledge the judgment, acknowledge they did it in a normal fashion. But that speaks... So a lot of this is about even that there are police officers still working who remember the days when they didn't have to do anything. Right? So they find this whole thing very strange. Right? Um, so, but yes, it does bleed a little, I think, is the short answer. OK. Uh, yeah, so um, you started to answer this uh, already in your uh, answer to David, but um, so a couple of interrelated things. I was just wondering, uh, firstly, what your sense of the limits of your access are, given that you're dealing with experts in covertness. Yes. And then, uh, <laughs> secondly, I was wondering uh, um, how much any of the policing you're dealing with is about uh, public protest and activism? Yeah, some of it has been, to answer the second question, and, and, and they, yeah, a limited amount of some of it, particularly things like animal rights, activism. You can imagine in Britain is a particular uh, concern, and, and so there's been some of that, and uh, yeah, some environmental activism. <laughs>
Uh, with regards to the, the sort of question about are we, what are we actually seeing and how much are they letting us see and the like, I mean, I, that's always the, the huge concern. You, in a sense, you never know, right? Um, I guess my, having done other empirical work uh, my, with the police, my sense is, and this is why you need the money to be there a long time, Right. This is why you actually embed people for two to three years, and that's what we've done it for two, is they eventually forget about you. Right? And my view is that, of course, some of, them, some of the officers are, by nature or by design, are going to keep you away from as much as they can. And, and we've encountered gatekeepers who have posed us with significant problems. We've had two things in our corner. One is the chief constable of the force uh, that we are working with has been uh, incredibly supportive. So when we've encountered gatekeepers who've blocked us, it's clear they're blocking us, uh, that person has stepped in and pretty much moved them out of the way. Now, whether they, there's another gatekeeper I don't know about <laughs> and there's a filing cabinet I've never seen, I, I'll never know. Um, but my sense is that what happens is when you're, you become part of the scenery uh, and to some extent you see quite a lot. And I think that's, that's one of the, I mean, I think one of the, the, the shame, the, uh, and this, again, this is that axe, uh, Getting the funding to do long... I mean, we've got three-quarters of a million pounds. I think it's one of the biggest grants for any ethnographic work that's been done in Britain for a long time. And it took years to organise the access and get all the pieces in place to get that money. Um, and that funded us for about a year and a half, two years in the field, right, for two researchers, and they weren't paid incredibly well, right? So it's, it's a huge financial commitment to do that sort of ethnographic work. I don't think many people do it anymore. And, but you need that long time horizon to get that level of comfort. And it took our researchers six months just to understand the organisational structures they were moving in, like actually know the acronyms, know who they were talking to, work out all the social relationships and who'd been where and who got promoted and all the stuff you need as an ethnographer to not make those mistakes that end up barring you, right? Those faux pas you make when you're interviewing someone. You know, you, I'm sure anyone who's done fieldwork knows that there are, it is fraught with traps, which, you know, traps for the, for, the, for the young player, so to speak. And uh, we... Thankfully, myself and I think the other two researchers, we all had experience of doing uh, one research. She'd done a lot of work in the police. Another one had done, he, uh, my other research, he'd done a, uh, an ethnographic study of the ANC in South Africa and spent two years living in the ANC offices in Johannesburg. So he had a bit of experience of the, the politics of things. So I think we, we hope we did that. I'll never know. And I'm sure there's stuff that we're just completely unaware of. Okay, there, I think, uh, there are three questions. The questions and answers are all going to have to be reasonably yeah, sorry. brief, please. Uh, yeah, um, no, no, sorry. The, the, sorry, you, sir. Yeah. The, uh, uh, my question about the relationship between uh, the police forces in the UK yes. and the uh, Europol and customs and immigration and, yes. and so on, is that, uh, how does that work? Is that uh, effective or ineffective? Or? Uh, I can speak briefly about Europol. I know less about immigration and customs, although I, there's a degree to which they can bully their way into all sorts of things. They have quite expansive powers, often well in excess of local police officers. Yeah. So, so when they really want stuff, they can get it pretty, pretty easily under the legislation. Europol, my sense of it is, uh, lots of information doesn't go to Europol because nobody really trusts Europol. Right? And within Europol, and I'm, this, is my, okay, this is my editorial, but I've done a little bit of work on this. Uh, cut the chase. The Germans in Europol don't trust the Southern Europeans in Europol. So when the Germans have, the Germans have very good information that they might want to share with a partner of Europol, they share it directly with the partner in Europol, not with Europol at large. Right? Because they're worried about the fact that that information may end up, right? All of the, all of the, the sort of institutional jealousies and, and stereotypes, they play out in Europol. So my experience is that Europol exists and it has a certain amount of critical information and lots of stuff gets, circuit, gets passed around, you know, around the table or outside the meeting, uh, not through Europol directly, because of those institutional distrusts. Interesting. Yes, thank you. Yeah, I was uh, <coughs> interested in the, uh, the comment you made about the police distinguishing between knowledge that would be used eventually as evidence and other kinds of knowledge. Yeah. And the reason I raised that is that I had cause to attend to a number of the days of the Air India trial. Mm -hmm. And I remember being shocked to the extent to which they didn't do this yeah. there. And I remember an exchange with the CSIS guy cross-examination and somebody asked him whether something somebody had said was, well, it was a direct quote or a paraphrase. Yeah. And he said, well, gosh, I never thought of that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and uh, uh, so, you know, I guess good for these guys, I suppose. Uh, yeah. But I'm, I'm really quite amazed that we're, 
you know, at least in that case, we're not seeing it. Can you offer any comments on that? Yeah, I mean, the only offer I think I can offer is uh, very briefly is I remain continuously surprised at how uh, capable a lot of middle to senior managers in the police in Britain are. Now, you might disagree with their decisions, but they're often extremely well thought through and, and sophisticated. And this is because in the last 20 to 25 years in Britain, there's been a massive increase in the level of education and experience of those, that group. The number of people I interact with who have masters in criminology, you know, who are, who are who, you know, really, these are well-educated, well-trained people who've thought carefully about those sort of questions. They're not, they don't, you know, that, that, non, that, that, that gap wouldn't be there. Um, I think to some extent the British police, or the English police certainly, don't get it as much credit as they might otherwise do compared to police forces around the world. They did go through this process of really trying to up their game in the middle management, pro middle management sections over the last 20 years. And they've had some success. And I think what you see now is you can talk to them about epistemology. Right? When you're interviewing them. <laughs> no, I'm quite serious. Right? You can say to them, you know, you've got a really interesting epistemology of covert knowledge. And they go, yeah, we have. Have you read this article? <laughs> no, they do. it's quite surprising. Uh, and it's wonderful from a research perspective. It's beguiling and dangerous, right? Because they're, you know, they're still within the culture of policing. These are not my colleague academics, right? They have a, these are people with a directed purpose. But I'd be surprised if they, you know, these, you know they, and as I was saying, they've had a long history of doing this sort of stuff, right? In certain contexts. Uh, okay, finally. So, so my number four guess is that the process of drafting legislation on covert operations is actually quite difficult because yep. police have certain methodologies that want secret, mm -hmm. and also because there is a type of third party independent research um, that you're talking about and doing that acts as some sort of balance. And my question, I guess, is what implications for the process of drafting legislation come out of this? Yeah, I mean, that's a, I mean, I think the, the legislation was rushed, and I think most people, with the exception of the Ministry of Justice in, in England, think it's bad. For some reason, the Ministry of Justice think it's a wonderful piece of legislation, and when they say this in public forums, the rest of the room gasps, the literally. Pardon? Um, the MOJ. It was the DCA, the Department of Constitutional Affairs, and now it's become the Ministry of Justice. It's within, it's within the Home Office. It used to be the Department of Constitutional Affairs. Um, so MOJ officials will say to you, but it's a wonderful place, we never hear any complaints. It's because they're complaining <laughs> to other people. Uh, a short answer is, the, and this is going to be, I think, an, um, a difficult part to write, I think the regulator is hugely to blame. The, regulator, when you st the regulator's advice is typically confidential. We've read lots of it. The regulator gives different advice to different forces on exactly the same points, which has fueled this whole force A thinks one thing and force B thinks one thing. It's not entirely their fault. The regulator um, often gives them the different advice. And so even the regulator, I don't think, is consistent in their interpretation of legislation. Ideally, I mean, I, what would happen is this piece of legislation would be scrapped. Right? It's, a terror, it's, just, it's unworkable and it's a bad, it's, it's, it's one of those cases where you just wipe terra nullius, you wipe the whole thing clean and start again and you have a proper collaborative process over a period of time. That won't happen, because it's not the nature of the legislative process, <laughs> particularly around this sort of thing. But it, that's ideally what should happen. Okay, thank you very much indeed. Yeah.